Welcome to the Infinite Life Podcast. I'm your host, Katish Haberfield. I am an intuitive sound healer and an incarnation guide. This podcast is for you if you wish to make sense of your life by understanding your past, present and future incarnations. For we are all spiritual beings in a human body who have never died, just changed costumes from life to life in order to have experiences that help our soul grow and expand. My hope is that this podcast helps you weave together strands from all lifetimes so that you can make peace with your journey and understand that you are a perfect expression of your soul in this moment in this incarnation. In today's episode, we are diving deep into the world of past life regression and are examining a recent experience with past life regression that I had. I'll be sharing the regressions that I completed to understand the pattern of current life, romantic relationships, and the role of soulmates in these. Interestingly, these are the first incarnations that I have come across where two past lives were females. There are four incarnations that I'm going to talk about today, two male and two female. The past life regression that I'm going to talk to you about was using a pre-recorded audio, meaning it wasn't live with the past life regression therapist, but both the intention and the script were highly customized to help navigate through romantic relationships and specifically talk about past life soulmate relationships. Now the reason I wanted to do this series of regressions at the moment was that we've just experienced the solar eclipse and the new moon, if you're listening to this in December 2021. So the new moon was at 12 degrees of Neptune in Sagittarius, which is exactly the degree point where my Neptune is in Sagittarius. So I knew it would be a big reveal for me and that I needed to do some past life regression regarding relationships because we currently have Venus retrograding in Capricorn. So that's the backstory to this episode. It's also important as I believe that if you want to walk the talk as a past life regression therapist, you have to do the work yourself. And so in 2022, I'm going to be offering new and specific past life regression therapy sessions in a package format, which will delve into romantic relationships. If I haven't done the work, how can I understand what you will experience when you undertake the work with me? So let's get started and I'll explain the process that I went through to understand a specific relationship in this life to see whether it had links to a relationship or two in a past life. So I enrolled in a course which allowed me to study some concepts and then also to experience those concepts using a pre-recorded series of regressions, both age regressions, past life regressions and future life regressions. You don't need to know what those are at the moment, but I will guide you through it as we work through the regressions and experiences that I had. The reason also that I wanted to undertake this is that I have been single now for two years, over two years since my previous relationship ended suddenly and drastically, and 10 years since my original divorce. So I'm keen to clear any current and past life drama, karma, and residues surrounding relationships. So I thought it was a good time to be brave enough to take a good deep insight into myself. So the beginnings of this were to simply create a journal where I would Note all of my thoughts regarding romantic relationships as far back as I could remember. This includes all the way back to primary school. So this includes casual people that I've dated, people that I've been in longer relationships with, people that I had crushes on, and then my marriage and then dating post-marriage. So then I then looked at my presenting issues And I picked out 
one person in particular that I wanted to analyze and go through the process of doing all these regressions about to see if there was some kind of a link so that I could actually analyze this relationship and clear any of the residues regarding this relationship. Now to protect the privacy of the person, I will not tell you who they are or how I know them because you never know. So that's the backstory to the episode and let's get into it. So the first thing I did was an age regression and then I did a past life regression using two different recordings. Both of these experiences were frustrating experiences for me due to the lack of the clarity that was gained from doing the past life regression myself. So if you're wondering, an age regression takes you back in time to your current life to find clues, people and situations which have residues that are affecting you in this life. So in the context of this, I was looking for information about relationship patterns and specifically in relation to one person in my life. In the age regression, one component was to identify and help your mind identify people in your life. And I clearly saw a face of a friend from primary school. And then I fell asleep and woke up when the therapist counted back from five to one at the end. You can imagine I was annoyed, really annoyed. This wasn't a good experience for me. When I calmed myself, I thought, well, actually, the lesson there is potentially that there's nothing that I needed to see from my present life that is important to the intention that I had set to find out about this particular relationship. Or I can heal any residue without being cinematically involved in the story of recreating the drama of the potential relationship and how I have known this person in my life so far. The next session was the past life regression session. I saw and heard and felt nothing other than being completely relaxed and a a feeling of searching so darn hard. That was until the regressionist voice said, now go to the last day of your life. And then I was able to see, but only a blurred vision, as if I was floating on the ceiling and looking down. I tried to focus my vision, but I could not. But then I was overtaken by emotion. Hot tears started rolling down my face and I heard myself saying, don't leave me. Then I started crying. In real life. In the now present moment. Whilst I was in trance. Crying uncontrollably. Sobbing. For many minutes until my energy floated away. And I was, as part of the past life regression, given healing in the afterlife. From this point onwards, I felt specifically just calm and no emotion anymore. The only message that I could ascertain from my spirit guide was the word joy, and that the romantic relationship that I had been involved in, in that life, brought me great joy. I felt as though I was a soldier lying on a bed, and that the woman I was talking to was a nurse, and it was wartime in some makeshift army hospital. I knew exactly who the woman was without even having to see her clearly. It was the man that I'm talking about that I wanted to examine the relationship through the series of regressions. So I found him, and that showed me that there was a link to a past life. I have known him before, and it explains the continual attraction and recognition and feelings that I have had over a very long period of time. After the regression ended, though, this is where the interesting thing happened. A huge energetic voltage ripped through my body and shook it and made me involuntarily spasm like a person having a seizure. I was not alarmed, as this always happens to me when I have big energetic shifts And it's like being struck by lightning. It actually hurts. Also, my head snapped fast from left to right several times as if somebody was clearing the memory physically from my mind or doing something to do with clearing. 
I have been to EFT practitioners before who ask you to clear from left to right when trying to clear a limiting belief. So it was similar in style to this. To say that the experience was exhausting was an understatement. However, to have such a cathartic cry with hot tears being produced whilst in trance and then have the electric energy occur when out of the trance, it was a bit like running a marathon. But I was pleased when that happened because I knew I was releasing something really big even if I was not allowed to see the visible story in the trance, in the regression. So it validated the experience for me and made it worthwhile. I couldn't see the events and the circumstances of the relationship in that lifetime, but I knew that I had just received a very large healing. So the experience was a little bittersweet and I hankered for more. I really wanted to be able to see the next lifetime. So the next day I loaded up the next regression recording in the series and I was determined to be able to see something this time myself. We had written exercises to complete about the intention of the session. Similar if you were with me doing a past life regression and I would be asking you questions. And the romantic and we had to answer and focus all of the answers around the specific romantic relationship we wish to investigate. So because I was so obsessed with actually being able to have a physical experience in the regression and not just having a cathartic energetic release in, in this one, I wrote the following things in my journal. I can handle whatever comes up. I can clearly see all the scenes of the regression. I allow myself to feel as much as I can handle. I allow myself to see myself no matter who I am in that past life. I can hear my spirit guide. I can see my spirit guide. I can receive guidance in the regression. I can learn lessons through past life regression and every experience I have is moving me closer and closer to understanding. The regression started with me being asked to walk down a set of stairs into a white room that leads out onto a garden. My stairs are always white marble with beautiful balustrading and they are inside a Hollywood-esque mansion or a castle depending upon the regression. The shoes generally change each time I do a regression as well. My garden is always one at the top of a mountain range in a private house where the fence overlooks the view and I lean over to gaze at the view. This time, when I walked out to the garden, it immediately morphed into a pool area and I was staring out at the pool, which seemed empty. I could not see anyone, although I got the sense that it was actually filled with people and that the area was crowded and it was a busy scene, but that I was being prevented from seeing the people. The regressionist in the recording asked me what my name was in that lifetime, and clear as day I heard in her trademark breathy voice, Marilyn, at which my ego mind interjected bullshit. I asked again, and she said the same thing, Marilyn. I became almost furious and was going to wake myself and turn the regression off. I remember thinking, there is no way in hell I was ever Marilyn Monroe. For a start, I hate wearing lipstick. Then the voice in my mind said, Ooh, but you've always wanted to have platinum blonde hair. The regressionist asked what the date was, and I answered, Sorry, Marilyn answered, 23rd of January, 1953. I was quite surprised because I know that in my own client sessions, often they struggle to get a time frame, and usually they can get a decade or a century, but not a specific date. So at that point, my ego mind kind of went, Hang on. There might be something here. And immediately after that, I heard the regressionist voice also say, even if it seems like make-believe, go with the story. It has a lesson to teach you, even if it is in story form. This seemed to be enough for my mind, and I surrendered to the experience. In my mind's eye, a white paw 
put itself on my right arm in reassurance, and I knew that White Wolf, my animal spirit guide, was here to help and reassure me during the session. So back to the pool. I knew it was a Hollywood pool party, but for some reason I felt out of place, like an outsider. When I say I, I mean Marilyn. Marilyn was showing me her life, and as such I was watching from beside her in the scenes, not through her eyes. Because I had spent so much time trying to process why I was seeing Marilyn, we were now taken to the last day of her life, and my perspective changed. That's the thing about doing a recorded, pre-recorded regression. You don't get to stop and pause and look and spend as much time as you want in between each life. You have to go with the pace that the regressionist sets in the recording. So, we were in another pool area, but a different pool to the previous one. I was now looking at her face, registering shock and horror that was on her face as a blue cloth was forced over her face and she died. Hot tears came streaming down my face in the present moment. So that's me as Katish in the trance, in the regression. And the thought came to me, oh, I always knew those theories were right. So she was murdered. The therapist then took us to the next life. Before I get to the next life from this session, let's talk a bit about what I experienced. Because we're talking about Marilyn Monroe, right? When I came to at the end of the session, because of the writing I'd done in the journal, I was then almost able to believe that Marilyn was me and I was Marilyn. But as I started to analyse it, I began to have doubts. There was, however, just too much to process from the three other regressions and three other lives that came after the Marilyn Monroe scene that I was so exhausted I just went to bed and decided to analyse it in the morning. Here are some of the insights that I got the next morning about Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn was destined to be a star, and she wanted to be a star. However, her visibility ended up being her death trap. Marilyn was murdered because she wanted Bobby to leave his wife. Bobby being JFK's brother. Marilyn had three marriages in her lifetime and it seemed as though her foot was always in the honeypot because of her desire to succeed in the film industry. The trouble was that when her foot was in the honeypot, it got stuck and eventually led to her downfall. Her image and career may have been successful, but her self-love was not prioritised and thus this reflected in her romantic relationships and experiences in that lifetime. Now remember... I don't know much about Marilyn Monroe. So then I was a bit perplexed and started watching a few videos and listening to recordings of her to make sure it was her that I saw in my past life regression. By the time I finished, I was convinced that I was not Marilyn Monroe, that her spirit had been drawn to me to help me illustrate a past life that I believe also spirits and entities can come and guide us to help us understand our lives by providing an an analogy to theirs. I feel this is the case where it may not be helpful for us to obsess about tracking down exactly who we were in a specific lifetime. Not everyone that has ever lived is Googleable, And if your highest self and spirit guides believe that it's in your highest and best interest to see the story and to show you a story similar to somebody else's, then we can understand the narrative of their life and its implications for our life, and receive the cathartic release emotionally without ever having to get bogged down in the details of the precise nature of their incarnation. So what I'm saying is, my higher self and spirit guides did not want me to see the exact scenes from my own life and knew that it was similar in outcome and events to show me Marilyn's life instead and I could by understanding Marilyn's life receive the healing that I needed to as well as the insights. It is a good reminder to ourselves that we are not our past incarnations. Whilst the activities over our 
of our soul over time shape who we are right now. The only person we can ever be is the person who is listening to this podcast right now. So if that is the case, and I am not Marilyn Monroe, we can just thank her for sharing her energy in that regression. And if we want to investigate it a little more, we can ask, why? Why, Marilyn? What is the connection? Now, this has taken the process of a week to analyze this and look back over all of the breadcrumbs. So in the weeks before the regression, I've been unusually drawn to watching a couple of Marilyn Monroe videos on YouTube. I noticed a floaty white dress in the window of a dress shop that has been catching my eyes every time I go past it. That's a modern version of the Marilyn Monroe famous white dress. I've been drawn to listening to Vogue by Madonna a lot lately. Marilyn's mentioned in that song. I've always been interested in the Kennedys. When I was a girl, the song Glad I'm Not a Kennedy by Shona Lang always stuck in my head and I remember very vividly the day that JFK Jr. and Carolyn Kennedy died. The link is that Marilyn was having an affair with Bobby Kennedy and sung the famous Happy Birthday Mr. President song to JFK. There's also conjecture as to whether she was seeing both brothers, but I don't have the answer to that. When I lived in a small winemaking town in New South Wales, one of the fabulous women I knew was famous for getting drunk and singing Happy Birthday Mr. President, Marilyn style. And I always wanted platinum blonde hair, which is another hair clue for you, but I've never achieved it. I've always admired 1950s clothing and jewellery, but I've tried it on and it's just not me. I can't pull it off or be bothered, to be frank, with the level of grammar. But having said that, I would not describe myself as a big Marilyn fan. Sure, I thought she was gorgeous and I love the fact that she was voluptuous, but I was a die-hard Audrey Hepburn fan instead. However, when I was growing up, we had a Marilyn impersonator who used to hang out in her lunch break at Hungry Jack's in the Queen Street Mall. I would always see her in the same spot and think it was funny to see the contrast of glamour of this lady dressed up as Marilyn Monroe and then the greasy burger joint where she would have her lunch break. My dad would always also see her catching the bus home at the end of his work day. And I would go up to her and talk to her in Hungry Jack's as a part of my grieving process after his death. I actually wrote a piece about it in that book that I never published, and it escapes me right now, but I'll look for it. In a previous regression, a, pr a week prior to recording this regression, I was trying to investigate a hunch that, saw that my soul had died in a car accident where I went over a cliff. Um, and in this regression, I saw a blonde woman from 1950s with short shorts and a big bus leaning over the Cadillac. I remember at the time thinking that perhaps I could have been Princess Grace in a past life, but that didn't feel right either, and hence I was doing this past life regression. And in this regression, I saw a woman who wasn't Marilyn, but she looked really similar to her. So all in all, that's a lot of Marilyn clues. And I think that Marilyn was sent to be a guide to help me through this past life regression because she knew that I was familiar enough with her to pay attention, to connect the threads of all the breadcrumbs through time. But she knew that I was also not attached enough to her as an idol to mistake her as my own incarnation. I feel as though my soul has definitely been a woman in the 1950s who died as a result of a bungled love affair with a married man. I'm not sure if there are any other similarities, and I'm not sure that it is important. The point was to show me the participation in an affair, and that the affair took place while both parties were married. Potentially it might also explain my aversion to lipstick, if we assume that the physical representation of Marilyn could be used as a stereotype of what I looked like broadly back then. It links up nicely with the theme of 
hair reveals for incarnation messages as well. If you've been following my emails on incarnation insights, or or listen to other past life regression insights that I've had, then you'll understand the thread of the hair. It also helps me to understand why recently I went to go back blonde and I looked at myself in the mirror and said, I just can't do that again. This is the right me for the moment. The right colour, the brown, is fine right now. If I do the blonde, it will feel fake. If you want to push it a little further, then I think there's also a little message in there about the fact that recently when I quit Facebook for the last time, I was very relieved to be able to concentrate on a medium where I could share my teachings without having to worry about doing my hair and makeup. And, uh, and to use a phrase that I've been known to say, I'm not a girly girl and I just don't understand how women know how to do their hair and makeup like that. It also explains a trigger that I had with my ex-husband. He was a bum kind of guy. I always say there were guys that are like bum guys or boobs guys. He liked women in short shorts. and I just can't wear those. I'm just not made that way. My thighs are way too womanly. I would always wear V-necks to highlight my nice cleavage, but he was seemingly not interested. His long-term partner now always wears cut-off shorts, even in winter. So with that, I think we have extracted as much as we possibly can about that part of the regression. Now to the second and the third lives. The second incarnation revealed in the recorded regression was a very similar story, but from a slightly different angle. So here it seems like repeating patterns being experienced through time in the field of relationships. Again, I knew the story instantly and easily transported myself along the journey as it played out through the regression. It was convincing enough for me to believe it, When I finished the journey and googled the name of the person revealed, I knew that it was an illustrative purpose only past life regression. So the same as Marilyn Monroe. The next identity to be to be revealed was not the story of my own life exactly. It was being illustrated in somebody else's story so that I could learn from it because it was similar enough to my story, to create cathartic emotional release. So the next identity, the next character, the next archetype to be revealed, she told me that her name was Daisy. Daisy Buchanan. And as soon as she said her name, I could hear it in her own voice, and I knew her life story immediately. I think lots and lots of people do. But before I get to her story... Let me just share you the the visuals I got which confirmed the storyline that was of Daisy Buchanan from the story The Great Gatsby. In my mind I was shown the green light flashing at the end of Daisy Buchanan's East Egg Dock and I was viewing it as though I was on Jay Gatsby's property looking over at the flashing light. When the regressionist asked me what the data was, My mind answered 1923. For me, the life was over fast as my mind just then flashed the entire story in a second like in fast motion. I already knew the story, so it was just to reinforce it for me in this regression. So, let's recap the story of the Great Gatsby briefly, so then we can draw out the messages for me. Because obviously... I can't have been a fictional character in a past life. It's just being used as an archetype. Daisy's story is the fictional story that is written by F. Scott Fitzgerald. It's a blend of the story of his wife, Zelda, and all of the other women he knew at the time, in the Roaring Twenties. The story was published in 1925. 
It was a couple of years ago recently popularised again in the movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, The Great Gatsby is one of my favourite novels all of all time. The movie was also brilliant. I've always loved the book and its tragic elements. When I was younger, I collected crystal decanters and always wanted to have a bar or a bar trolley, just like I imagined they would have in the 1920s. I love the fashion of 1920s, but again, I've never been drawn enough to wear flapper-style outfits. They just don't suit me. So The Great Gatsby is set in the Jazz Age on Long Island, New York City. And the novel depicts the first person narrator, Nick Carraway, and his interactions with Jay Gatsby, the mysterious millionaire, and Jay Gatsby's obsession to reunite with his former lover, Daisy Buchanan. Despite the fact that she is now rather inconveniently married to Tom, and has a daughter. It's a tragic love story. So, what was the message of the life of Daisy Buchanan for me? Well, when we have a look at the story of The Great Gatsby and of Daisy and Tom's life, it shows the continuation of the theme of messy relationships and extramarital affairs. It seems like my soul did not learn the lesson of the lifetime portrayed by the story of Marilyn, so I came back again to relearn it. At least this time I was not killed as a result of the relationship, so that's a tick for my soul. Well done. However, Daisy's marriage with Tom is not happy, and he has a lover, Myrtle, in this story. So I guess it was only fair that Daisy found a little love and action herself, right? Well... In life, there are always consequences, intended or not, for our actions, and this is a tangled love story. If you don't know the story, in this story, both of the lovers of Tom and Daisy die. Yep, Myrtle and Jay, spoiler alert, both die. And the Buchanans get off scot-free, so to speak. They get to keep their life of illusion and wealth and great unhappiness and it's at the expense of the happiness of others. Jay Gatsby, lover of Daisy, is ultimately murdered by Myrtle's husband. That's the, ma- that's the lady that Tom was having an affair with. In a case of deliberate but mistaken identity. After Myrtle is killed when she runs out to the road, thinking she has heard Tom's car, only to be struck by the car. In the car is not Tom but Jay Gatsby, who's driving with Daisy. But it is Daisy who is behind the wheel. It is Daisy's whose driving action kills Myrtle. Quite ironic, really. However, what happens next is the tragedy. George, the husband of Myrtle, he kills Jay Gatsby to revenge his wife's death because in his grief, he wrongly two and two together and concludes that Myrtle was running out to see Jay because she knew the sound of Jay's car and Jay was her lover. He knew she was having an affair. But in reality, Tom was her lover, not Jay Gatsby. And the car and the person driving it was Daisy, the wife of the person that Myrtle was having an affair with. It's the great tragedy and irony of the story. Also, the backstory is that Jay Gatsby was originally Daisy's lover before she married Tom. So what happened was that Jay and Daisy met when they were very young and Jay Gatsby came from a very poor family. Daisy was a socialite from a very rich family. They fell in love, and Jay knew that he would never be allowed to have Daisy's hand in marriage because he wasn't from the right social standing, and he didn't have money. So Jay went off to war, and then he reinvented himself and became very rich 
in a kind of a very scandalous way. But wealthy and rich he is when he comes back to town seeking to find Daisy, only to find that she is married already and has a child. This doesn't stop his obsession. So, if we take it back to the story of the incarnations and the relationships and the soul mate story that's coming along in my lineage, then we have yet again another disaster. Love has led to death. Tom and Daisy have stayed hap- unhappily married ever after, and I'm sure Tom is allowed to have many affairs under and above the radar for the rest of his life. Daisy knowing her actions have led to the death of her lover, probably never has an affair again, and lives a life pretending to be happy whilst drinking her misery away for the rest of her life. On the surface, they have all that life can provide, but underneath, they have nothing. So what I discovered was that I was Daisy, and the particular person who I've been investigating romantically and trying to understand my connection with was Tom. What I find interesting about this story being showed to me in my past life regression is that it explains a couple of things for me. I have always been dead against affairs. Even as a teenager, I would never ever cheat on someone that I was in a relationship with, no matter how attractive the person who was flirting with me was. I could not understand why people didn't just leave relationships and be done with it. If you're interested with somebody else, then surely it's time to leave the relationship that you're in. To me, it was black and white, a non-negotiable. And now we've got that context why it was non-negotiable for me. I won't say that it made it any easier for me. For example, I dated a guy in university for four years even though the relationship was miserable for probably three and a half of those, or no, probably three. And I was attracted to other people, but I never did anything about it because I thought it was immoral. Even though I was only just a late teenager. It doesn't really make sense, really, if you're in a bad relationship at university. Just move on. Everyone else does. The second thing that was interesting was placement in the birth family. Given what I just said, it makes sense to me now that I would choose to be born in a family where my parents would stay married without any affairs until death do us part. My mother and father were married until my father died. My mother has not repartnered. My soul's experience matched with the potential experience of the family I was to be born in. Clearly, in this lifetime, I needed this environment for stability and for me to progress. Sometimes the families we choose to be born in provide us with negative experiences that will provide contrast to help us grow, and other times they are chosen for the safety they provide. This provides us with the ability to explore other themes that we need in our lifetime. Remember, your higher self is not a sadist. We are rarely born into a situation of our own choice where every single element we have in our life is a contrast. We'd go mad. I chose to be in a family where I knew the relationship would be stable and not end up in divorce or affairs because I needed the contrast to show me what I didn't like or want. And now it's only just starting to make sense with this past life reveal. Third point that I've learned from this past life regression. The American dream and the concept of the perfect family and marriage. That's the essence of the story of the great Gatsby. The ideal of perfection and materialism and success. And that which it costs us in real life. I've always had high ideals and expectations about family life. Even my astrological birth chart shows that my demands on lovers and ideals about family life borders on fantasy and can be unrealistic to some people. So perhaps this story was to remind me once again that the dream is not what is needed. The great American dream, the perfect family, 
I've tried that before. In my own version of Tom and Daisy Buchanan's life. And look where it led me. The next concept that I learnt from this past life reveal is that the past is the past. Jay Gatsby fell in love with Daisy a long time before she met Tom. So when he finally was in circumstances when he could win Daisy back, he kind of went on a journey that cost him his integrity in order to achieve a goal that was no longer obtainable. He made the fatal mistake of assuming that people don't change, and to extent, that's true. Daisy was always shallow, and her nature did not change, as the story shows along the way. She was still the girl inside that he loved. However, there were other factors involved when Jay Gatsby turned up again, including a child and a husband, so the situation was not the same. Time had passed and life had become more complex. Looking back to what was, the image that Jay had in his mind about Daisy was merely an illusion. It no longer was reality. Time had passed. And you cannot say, I wish I'd made a different decision. Or I need to hold back on living until I can have this idealised relationship manifest. Life has moved on without you. The opportunity is forsaken. To assume that you can pick up where you left off is to live partly in the past, in another timeline that exists only in your head and to ignore the reality of your life. I think this lesson is particularly valid and hard for those of us who have had a one that got away fantasy living in our head. The bit where we kid ourselves that the timing was not right, but will be right in the future. The point is that in most cases the timing was not right for a reason and it will never be right. That point particularly hits me as I write this podcast episode as I ask my higher self to show me lives lived with that particular person or to show me scenarios whereby the themes of the past life managed the situation that presented me. What I was provided with was three stories of past lives lived with a person for me who was Mr. The One That Got Away. It explains to me the intense connection that I feel and the sense of internal desperation as it has never come to be. Even though I had this intense feeling. But now I understand that we tried three times already. He was the character archetype of Tom Buchanan in one life and Bobby Kennedy in another. So we'd been married before and he was in the scene where I was the soldier and he was the nurse. And in the third life that was revealed, I was the male this time and I murdered them. Talk about a love triangle. Now, what do you mean? I guess you're wondering. No, I haven't told you about the third life that was revealed. Well, actually, sorry, the fourth life that was revealed. The only sign, the only scene that I saw from the third life from this past life regression was a single scene. It happened so fast because my mind was still trying to process the second and first past life regression, so the Marilyn and Greg Gatsby scenes, when the, the regression therapist moved on too fast to the next life in the recording. That's what happens when you use a pre-created recording rather than dealing with a therapist in real time. You can't modify the speed of the regression. And so my brain wasn't ready to move on and all there was time left for me to be shown was one image. <sighs> I observed myself in a scene, in a forest. 
I was standing and I looked down and I saw a body, which was a female's body, laying face down in the snow. The girl was dead. She was wearing a white shirt through which I could see a huge pool of blood, as though she'd been shot in the back. I knew I was not her because I was standing over her. And in my mind, the only information I was given was audibly. I audibly heard the word Twin Peaks. I knew then that this was another analogy, another archetype, another scenario. But not having watched the TV series, I did not know the specifics. Suffice to know that this is how the relationship ended in that life. The wheel of life had turned again. We had tried one more time. I was the male this time, and I killed her. What a disastrous series of relationship attempts. Honestly, no wonder there's been this urge and pull, but nothing has come together. There was supposed to be a fourth life in the regression, and he, the regressionist did take me through to a fourth life but my brain honestly could not process it fast enough and it went into a blur combined with the complete frustration and by the time my mind got my head all around it the regressionist was counting up from five and I was awake and back in the room so I experienced mind-blowing level of insight but also very different scenes by simply asking the question what is up with this relationship that has never really met the right timing I was simply saying I'm ready to move on to a new relationship it's been a couple of years but I want to clear the baggage of past relationships and let me pick this guy to investigate to see what there is to excavate so that I can clear it Oh boy, we found a lot, didn't we? We found the nurse and the and the um and the soldier death scene where I had that really cathartic big cry and the huge energy voltage. The next life is the Marilyn Monroe lookalike kind of scene whereby I'm presented with the story of Marilyn Marilyn Monroe's tragic life. And I discover that I've lived a life similar to the story of Marilyn Monroe. And in that scene, I was Marilyn and he was Bobby Kennedy. So in that lifetime, I did not marry him. I had an affair and then he murdered me. Then the next lifetime, we were married, husband and wife, but we both had affairs and both of the people that we had affairs with ended up dead. (laughs) Goodness gracious me. And then the final one is where I am then back in the woods with him, except for he is a she and I have murdered her. Oh dear. (laughs) Oh dear. It is taking me three days to process these lives in my mind. And pieces and understandings are continuing to come to me. Whilst they've been very invaluable in providing lessons for teaching purposes, they were not 100% satisfying to me. They've taken an incredible amount of brain power to process, but they have showed me a pattern of relationships and answered a specific question that I had. And I did receive cathartic emotional release But I am acutely aware that had this session been done in person, it would have taken at least three to four hours. I could have gone in depth with the fourth forest scene and another hour or two to get that original nurse and soldier story, rather than crammed into a one hour pre-recorded audio regression. I would have also been able to access therapeutic aspects of it by removing limiting beliefs and had the regressionist give me insight and clarity into the specifics. They could have asked me questions which would have provided me with specific answers and further clues. All in all, it would have been much more powerful. 
However, it was still a valid experience. I believe the experience is complete. By using archetypal stories from both fiction, movies and a real celebrity, I was able to access the insight into my lives, see a pattern and know with all certainty that I need not delve into trying to find out more trying to find out more about these lives. There are so many others and many other adventures to understand that will provide further understanding and clarity to heal my heart and my understanding of how to conduct myself in relationships and how to choose who to have relationships with coming forward. For that I am truly grateful and I thank Marilyn I thank Marilyn for volunteering to assist me in this way. It is also interesting that the copyright for the novel The Great Gatsby expired this year and it is now in the public domain. And I experienced this regression and these stories on the night of the solar eclipse, so this story has now had its time and is ripe for energetic release. However, there is one more element to it. I mentioned age regression, past life regression, and then future life progression. Okay, so future life progression. So the stage is now set for the future life progression. The future life can be the future life of this life that I'm in currently now, so in time, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, or a future incarnation, a real future life. It's not a prediction of the future. A future life progression is a way for your mind to show you the potential results, a potential new relationship or the consequences of a relationship depending upon the processing and changes to the behavior that you make in your current life so what is shown in your future lives depends upon the intent on this in, of the session and what you want to be shown it's a bit like showing you multiple different timelines and you get to pick and choose the timelines that you see according to different actions or modified behaviors that you want to investigate. So option A, B and C. So again, I went back to the pen and paper and spent time writing out my intention for the session and then mentally in my mind worked out what I thought a couple of the potential future life outcomes could be. And I thought a lot about the poem that I read you in a previous episode about walking down the street. As far as I could see, the options were walk down another street entirely meaning don't even think about interacting in this life again with that person, especially in a romantic context. Or walk down the same street, but be aware of the great big bloody hole. Know how the past lives have worked out, so avoid affairs, but work on the happiness of a relationship and enjoy it for what it is. Third option, be friends, but not romantic. I already know that that one is not possible. So, with that scene set, it's time for the future life progression. I'd like to also make something clear that I didn't make clear at the start, which I should have. This person is not currently in my life. It's just an investigation of what if. I didn't fall asleep, which is a bonus in this regression, and I was concentrating. But I could not see the first two options of potential lives So when the third option came through, that was when I got some success. It's not until the final future life, the alternative future life option, that I saw a life that directly linked to the past life regressions that we've been speaking about through this episode. The regressionist said, you may have a choice to make in your present life about your relationships or life direction. Imagine now an alternative choice you could take in this life. Confirm that alternative choice now. With hindsight, I'm thinking, my mind said, despite everything that I've learned through all the past life regressions, I choose to go down the same street. I have no idea if that's correct, because I didn't hear a word of what the regressionist was saying. All I could do was feel a sense of dread and fear coming up in my body and a mild sense 
that turned into a very large sense of panic. Everything behind my eyes went darker in colour, like a shadow going across a forest, and I wanted to shout out, Oh no! I was back in the forest, the Twin Peaks one, except this time I was the female. So, to my mind, I felt it was a current life progression rather than a next life. We had moved to, a, to the forest and lived there. I saw us walking hand in hand, interlocked, and I had this terrible feeling of foreboding fear. My body was reacting to the knowledge that in the previous life, the forest scene is where a murder was committed. And I thought, oh my God, I'm the female this time around. He's about to murder me. But then the light came into my eyes, filled my eyes with huge, bright whites and yellows and golds, just sparkling. And I saw that actually this was, there was great happiness. The next scene was many hands joined in a circle of hands. And then the next thing, more explosive light, and I was above, looking down on the circle, and there were many children looking up at me with happy smiles as if they had just released a butterfly. But I knew it was my spirit that had just released and I had died. But I was in such a shock to see such a similar scene to the forest scene that I had originally seen that I still had that bodily response of overwhelming fear of death and being murdered, like something in that scene had not been revealed properly. And then I heard the words, You will have to learn to trust. Trust him and yourself. For without it, the trust, the ending will be the same as before because your over-analysis of the relationship will bring fear and jealousy. Trust. If you want this way forward, if you want this option, you must learn to trust in yourself 100% and there must be no shadow of doubt. So, <laughs> honestly, couldn't do anything more after that. And... um. It took me a good hour to two hours to remove that fear from my body. And I think I'll still be processing that over the next few days. And because I've only done one future life progress in, in that series, I will come back and do a couple more to see what else I can reveal. But the insight that I got after that fear had subsided was, yes, this relationship could go the way of your fairy tale, fairy tale mind, the way that you feel like it should have always gone. There is that opportunity because you haven't had that balancing effect in this lifetime. However, the knowledge of the current life relationships that you have both been in and the knowledge that you are both still exhausted from these experiences I would both probably rather just stay single in your own ways means that it would have to be a conscious decision and it would take work to ensure that these past life patterns didn't subconsciously and unconsciously rear their ugly heads again. At which point I thought, I'm not sure if I'm up to it. Maybe I'll just go down the other road and followed by well it's okay I've come to the understanding that what we don't complete in one life we have the opportunity in our past life in our, our life review to come back down and do it again in the next life so maybe there will be the opportunity in the next life where we will be both refreshed and ready to start again. Maybe that's the best time. I don't know, to be honest. We'll see. 
For now, the journey continues. I have my answer that this is a past life connection. And I also know that this is only one side of the story. This is what my mind has chosen to show me. I can never know the side of the story from his perspective. But I can know my own truths and the lessons that this has revealed. It has been a worthwhile experience for me and I hope that sharing my experience of an age regression, a couple of past life regressions and a future life progression has given you an idea of how the theme of romance and soulmates and relationships can be explored. It is quite complicated and it's not for the faint hearted, but I believe that it is important to understand our lives and the repeating and balancing patterns that we have with karmic relationships over time. And to understand that if you really truly do wish to do the work to understand yourself and your soul's journey over time, you understand that there is great learning to be gained, that there is power in understanding the balancing effect of karma and of seeing your soul experience relationships from all angles. And as I explained to you at the very start of this episode, if you're keen enough and you'd like to explore one of your own relationships, perhaps you have a question about should I stay or should I go or should I enter a relationship with Perth or what is this? feeling that I have about the one that got away, then you're welcome to come and do a past life regression or series of regressions, age, past life and future regressions with me in 2022. I hope you can see how difficult it is to work through this on your own and it would be an honour and a pleasure to help you guide you through this process which will be deeply transformative. If nothing else, it will provide you with great insight into yourself and to your needs and why you are the way you are. These sessions will be offered to my clients first and to those who are on my email newsletter, which is Incarnation Insights and can be found on my website at katish.com. So thank you for joining me for this long and in-depth episode. I hope it has interested you rather than bored you and know that it has been quite the journey for me to not only go through these regressions but then have the time to process them and draw out the learnings so that you could learn from them as well. Oh, and by the way, originally... As I said, there was that song Vogue by Madonna and all the insights that led to the Marilyn Monroe reveal and the series of lives. I've had a new song appear in my head that I can't stop hearing or singing. Maybe you'll know it. It's time to saddle up for the next adventure. I wonder where it will lead. I'm a cowboy on a steel horse I ride. I'm wanted, dead or alive. And that, my friends, is the end of this episode. I look forward to spending more time with you next week. For further information about how you can use sound journeys to access other incarnations, you can visit my website at katish.com, where you can read my blogs and also subscribe to my newsletter, Incarnation Insights. To send me a story about one of your Incarnation Insights, head to the voice recording facility at katish.com forward slash the infinite life podcast. Until next time. 
take care